Guy on Indy presents the podcast. Today's topic, Malcolm X. Today's special guest, Dr. David Polizzi. Today's podcast is sponsored by Indie Filmmakers Forum at yahoo.com. Are you interested in professional production and live in the Midwest? Then contact Indie Filmmakers Forum at yahoo.com, the premier film networking group in the Midwest. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. David Polizzi discussing Malcolm X and his book, A Phenomenological Hermeneutic of Anti-Black Racism in the Autobiography of Malcolm X. Welcome back, David. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about Chapter 7 in your book, After the Nation, From Malcolm X to Malcolm El Shabazz. Now, in this period, there is a separation between Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, most specifically uh, the uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, excommunicates him, basically, right? Okay, could you talk a little bit about that separation and the effect it had on Malcolm? Yeah, well, the issue was about, as it turns out, the infidelity of Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. He's in, impregnated a number of his secretaries. Mm -hmm. um, word gets back to Malcolm, as far as I understand it, from Elijah Muhammad's children, mm -hmm. um, a few of them anyways, and it now becomes public. Mm -hmm. Malcolm talks about it. He tries to get around it. Doesn't he try to show that it's some prophecy that's in the yeah, Bible? Yeah, and it also happened. This is also happening around the same time uh, of the Kennedy assassination, mm. which is really the last straw. And it's the chickens coming home to roost. And when, you know, that's why he's silenced, because, you know, Elijah Muhammad said no statement from anybody about the assassination of the president. Right. Um, and he goes ahead and they ask him, right? He said, are you, how do you feel about the Kennedy assassination? And he says, well, being an old farm boy, uh, being an old farm boy, um, when chickens came home to roost, I was always happy. Mm. Um, and that got blown up. and. Yeah. He's immediately censored and silenced, and that that starts the the obvious drift. And then he announces the creation of his two organizations. Because initially he censors him and says you're off for three months or something right. like that. But he soon realizes that no, he's being politically right. thrown out. Right. He realizes right. that. Uh, proclaiming his submission right. and his obedience isn't going to do the trick. Right, and there's people like uh, Louis Farrakhan who write in the magazine or the newspaper that Malcolm created, mm -hmm. Malcolm's, uh, Mohammed Speaks, that Malcolm is like Benedict Arnold and he draws a picture of Malcolm's head cut off and it's rolling mm -hmm. and he's seen as the hypocrite and he's seen as the defiler of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. Um, ironically, uh, Farrakhan wasn't well res well respected that much, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. by uh, Elijah Muhammad and the family, mm -hmm. because the, their sense was, well, wait a second, you loved this man, and now you're stabbing his back, stabbing mm -hmm. him in the back and mm -hmm. trying to hurt him, and they re really was, we don't really trust you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Um, he sort of, he has to take a back seat. They don't trust him so much. But mm. Malcolm now goes on a trip. He goes to Saudi Arabia. Right. And th now this, he gets money from his sister Ella to finance the trip. To Well, he gets also, he gets help um, from the Saudis, from the Egyptians. Oh, he does. Okay. Yeah, because, because they knew that what was going on in America had nothing to do with Islam. Gotcha. And so he had a... Go to, if I'm remembering, he had to go to now, Egypt. From a Muslim, a Sunni Muslim perspective, is the nation, nation of Islam like a cult? Or what do they consider it, it would in be, their perspective? It would be, it would be blasphemy. It's Probably, blasphemy. Okay. I would think, yeah. Because yeah. there was no really discussion of the Quran or Allah. And, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. and they wouldn't have the veneration of Elijah Muhammad... Yeah. That would have been blasphemy. What? A, yeah. Um, so that wouldn't have worked very well. Okay. Um, so now, now uh, Malcolm X goes to Saudi Arabia first, 
and to do the Hajj. Well, he goes, I believe, to Egypt first. Egypt And, and then he has to get a sponsor. And I think it was the Mufti from either Egypt or Saudi Arabia that mm -hmm. signs it and allows him to go. Because <clears throat> only true Muslims can go. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be verified in some way. Right. And so he needed that verification before he could go. And then he goes and... As he describes in the, in, in the text, and as uh, I think Spike Lee correctly seems to chronicle based on everything that you can see and research about it, that because there's no such thing as simply black Muslims, mm -hmm. and so he's interacting with white people, and he's mm -hmm. interacting with white people who treat him as mundane, mm -hmm. who treat him as simply another believer on this so he's Understand. just a, another. To he them. is just another. Uh, he's uh, another. Yeah, and we could say another like, in the in the Heideggerian sense. Heideggerian sense. You right. are just like me. You're just like me, right? Because he says, you know, in, in the film, and I think he says in in the book as well, you know, I've eaten out of the same plate with white people, drank from the same cup, yeah. you know. So the Hajj, uh, from Malcolm X's perspective, is a transformative experience. Sure. On his philosophy, on his look towards race. Uh, towards his look towards religion and, mm -hmm. and his and his uh, submission to Islam, the, mm -hmm. which he calls the true Islam. Right, yeah. right. Okay. And it's important to note that in the seventies, in the mid seventies, when Elijah Muhammad dies, mm -hmm. one of the first acts of his son is to turn the nation into a legitimate Sunni Islamic organization. Okay. And. I think some money was given to the mothers of those kids out of wedlock. Mm. Um, and there was a fundamental change that this was going to be a true Sunni Islamic organization. Okay. Um, a few things I want to also talk about that we, we haven't talked about. Uh, uh, when Malcolm X is in prison, he says he has an experience where a gentleman comes into his room and sits down. And is he referencing F.D. Fard? Because he says, mm -hmm. like, Paul had an experience of Jesus, and yeah, so he yeah. can relate to that. He never says it, right. but he implies that mm -hmm. he had met the F.D. Fard. Is, yeah, am I yeah, reading that yeah. wrong? And Fard is an interesting character. There's some questions. I mean, is he supposedly from Turkey? Yeah. Um, and he sold silks? Yeah, he sold a lot of stuff, evidently. Yeah. And Elijah Muhammad meets him. I want to say while they were in Noble Drew Ali's movement. Okay. And then they then Noble Drew Ali is killed. This had been about sometime in the 40s. Mm. And then Elijah Muhammad, and I think Fard as well, but certainly Elijah Muhammad get in trouble because they're claiming conscientious objection and they don't want to go to the war. Mm -hmm. And then finally they're in prison for a little bit. And... If I'm remembering right, the, the nation of Islam becomes almost a, it's just a name that pops into his head. Okay. There, there's another name, and I, I'm i sorry, I don't have that information. But he there. comes up with it after yeah, he did. Well, they come up with it because they're yeah. in another organization after they, they're no longer involved with the Noble Draw Lee sect. Oh. And now the FBI are on them. It's in part because of this conscientious objection right. and his um, skipping out on the draft, et cetera. Right. And then he's in, in a couple of the accounts, and these were specific accounts of biographies on Elijah Muhammad. That he just he kind of comes up with it to throw off the authorities, in a sense, mm -hmm. right? To mm -hmm. sort of be able to lay low so they'll give him a break. Mm -hmm. And then he just keeps it; it stays, and it's still around today. Even. Yeah. Now, now, is there subtext? Does Elijah Muhammad have anything to do with Farge's disappearance? Or is that implied or not? I've never heard anything. No, no, okay. There, I just yeah. wonder, there's one character and he takes mm. over, and then Malcolm has seemed to be the next, you know, guy to take the baton, and he gets axed, you know, so. Well, it was, there was a lot of violence um, with groups that split from the nation <clears throat> around the same time of the splits with Malcolm. Yeah. And there was a group that uh, Lew Cinder, who then became a Karim Abdul-Jabbar, um, yeah. was connected to. And the nation tried to kill them, and it was a very um, oh. kind of spectacular event, 
spectacular in its tragicness where mm. six or seven members of the nation go in and kill about 13 people. Wow. They try to wipe out his whole family. Mm. And the, he wasn't there, but everyone else dies. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, so there when was, was this? This mid 70s. Mid-70s. So, so there was uh, a lot of violence within the nation, in yeah. a sense, cleaning up the renegades, so to speak. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, is there anything else that we haven't discussed in your book that you'd like to discuss now? No, I think we've covered it. Mean, again, it's hard um, in such short segments yes. to, to really get at things. Yeah. So I hope no one is offended by the the kind of the various topics we dealt with at, at a rather uh, breakneck speed. I think we just touched on a few of the tops. If you want to know more, please read Dr. David Pleasy's book, A Phenomenological Herm- Hermeneutic of Anti-Black Racism in the Autobiography of Malcolm X. And there's a number of things out now, in other words, newer books. Um, also, it is, I think, on Netflix, an interesting series on who really killed Malcolm X mm. that kind of speaks to the obvious conspiracy mm. that a couple of the guys... Um, who served time, one of whom died, he was never exonerated. It had nothing to do with it. They weren't there. Hmm. Um, There's an interesting part in the autobiography, and it it seems to have been backed up by a number of of different published accounts, that there was an undercover FBI agent in the ballroom the night before, Hmm. and he talks to his supervisors and says, I think I just watched the dress rehearsal of the assassination of Malcolm X, oh, wow. who was due to speak the next afternoon mm-hmm. where he's ultimately killed. There's no police presence mm-hmm. in the building. And is that unusual? Yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> highly, what, highly, highly unusual. unusual. Okay. And for some reason, Malcolm didn't want any of his bodyguards there either. Wow. Um, they would have had much more security, but his sense was, no, we need to... We need to give a different image Mm. than having bodyguards and all this stuff. Um, Evidently, the claim was that he had the names of the people who were going to murder him in his pocket. Mm. Wow. And there is a sense that he kind of knew that the time was quite near. It's so tragic. It's so tragic. Uh, It's unfortunate that his life turned out the way it is, but it's inspiring. His life inspires even me to be pro pro provocative in life to not look at yourself as someone that can be stepped on or stepped over absolutely uh david thank you so much for your time and thank you for being a guest on guy on indy thank you take care take care now bye thank you david (laughs) hi it's guy on indy i'm here to sing it's true a song by guy thomas lowry A man can move a mountain, it's true, not really a hard thing to do. Find the right mountain, find the right means, have the right methods, oh so it seems. Nothing can stop you unless they deem it's you they'd most like to move.